I think we can get at least started with the introductions. Um, thank you all for coming, and I do want to remind everybody you should be getting an email um, that Dr. Khan, our guest speaker, will be doing the AOA Visiting Professor Lectureship uh, tomorrow at the same time, but in the eighth floor, five floors above us, uh, lecture hall. Um, it's kind of funny. Can I share your story? Sure. Doc, Dr. Khan and I had actually just met, but we did, uh, we rounded with our team together, and it seemed like we were an, a, a well-rehearsed team. And what did one of the students ask you is, how long have you known each other? Because they figured that we had choreographed this. And it actually turns out that uh, we didn't know it, but we are um, children of a different mother, I guess. Um, brothers of a different mother. But anyway, um, so I've actually enjoyed very, very much. It, it's, it's always wonderful to meet new people, but it's even um, more enjoyable when you actually like them. And I really, really enjoyed meeting you and spending time with you today. Dr. Khan is the is Senior Associate Dean for Admissions and Student Affairs at Tulane. He's also the Peterman uh, Prasser Professor of Medicine in the section of Hematology and Oncology. He trained at the University of Pennsylvania and then started on the faculty at Tulane, I think, in 1994. Um, he has received multiple teaching awards, and I had the option of listing them, but I decided I wanted to leave him some time to talk today, so I'm not going to mention all of your teaching awards, but they are numerous and they would have used up our hour. He also not uh, being educated enough, felt he needed to be more educated, so he decided to get an MBA. And in 2010, he got an MBA from Tulane's Freeman School of Business. So this is a man who likes to keep learning new stuff. His research interests include non-malignant hematology, financing academic medical centers, and medical education. He's very involved in those topics. He's been a member and vice chair of the American Society of Hematology Committee on Educational Affairs. He's written for the first five editions of the American Society of Hematology. We know it as ASH, the self-assessment program, and served as the associate editor and editor for the second and third editions of that. He's also worked with the American College of Physicians uh, medical knowledge self-assessment program for the past decade and actually was able to give us some wisdom on kinds of questions people might be expected to know answers to. In addition to his involvement with the American Society of Hematology, he's also held, held national leadership positions with the Association of American Medical Colleges and serves on the uh, board of directors of the National Residency match program. I didn't know this, but he was also a program director in internal medicine for several years. So him and Dr. Greenberg share things in common. So without uh, wasting further of your time, I'd love you to talk to us about what the internist might see when we Thank you very much, um, Dr. Marion, and thank you um, uh, for inviting me today. Thanks to, to Jane uh, and Mark Platt for inviting me for the AOA talk. And what I thought I would do today is talk about something that um, uh, we see as hematologists, we see as internists, and um, but I wanted to be specific about the hemolytic anemias that you, uh, in fact, may see in your practice. And I'm going to focus mostly today on sickle cell anemia, the autoimmune hemolytic anemias, and we're going to finish up with a, just a little bit um, about uh, G6PD uh, deficiency. So I have uh, nothing to disclose. I have nothing to lose. So I'm going to ask a question, because I don't like to talk at people. I like to kind of have a, a, a free conversation. So a 58-year-old woman with a history of Hashimoto thyroiditis presents for evaluations of anemia for the past eight months. On exam, she has lemon yellow skin and ecteric sclera. Her laboratory studies are significant for a hemoglobin of 5.6, an MCV of 105, 
a tick count of 0.5%, a total bill of 9.5%, and a direct bill of 2.1%. So um, we're going to use uh, analog audience response. This is a yes, no. So analog, raise your hand for yes, raise your hand for no. So who thinks this patient is hemolytic anemia? Who doesn't think the patient is hemolytic anemia? Who is sleeping and not participating? Anyway, we're going to go ahead. So, you know, whenever um, I asked the students this this morning, but we have a patient with anemia, so the first thing we're going to do is? Well, the first thing we're going to do is peripheral smear. Good. All right. So, peripheral smear, this doesn't project real well. But um, what you see is, um, is that you see a poly in this field with one, two, three, four, six lobes. And we all know that about 20 percent maybe of our polys can have up to five lobes, but we should never have six lobe polys. So when you learn more about this case, this is a case of cobalamin deficiency. So the question is, is this hemolytic anemia? Well, as I'm about to show you, in fact, the first historical description of hemolysis was in patients who were cobalamin deficient. Why? Well, because cobalamin is a necessary vitamin for the synthesis uh, and maintenance of um, hemoglobin and red blood cells. And when you don't have cobalamin, your, re your, eryth your erythropoiesis is ineffective and you actually destroy red cells. It occurs in the marrow, but this was first described by Paul Ehrlich as a type of anemia that was hemolytic rather than hemogenic. And that was really the first term. So this patient, in fact, has cobalamin deficiency. I, I think I said Paul Ehrlich. It was actually Hunter. And the retic count um, here is low, whereas, in, with, at, whereas with a hemolytic process that we're more accustomed to, the marrow would respond with an increased number of reticulocytes. We may see nucleated red blood cells, et cetera. But this is a marrow that's deficient. So this is ineffective hematopoiesis. And in fact, an elevated LDH, an elevated bilirubin are not uncommon. And for the older people in this room with gray hair, we remember lemon yellow as being one of those descriptions of cobalamin deficiency. Why? Because you're yellow from the ineffective hematopoiesis and elevated bilirubin, but you're pale. So that paleness plus yellow in fair skin patients gives you a, a lemon yellow appearance, very different than the jaundice that we see in liver disease. So hemolysis, again, the first term was first used in 1901 by William Hunter in his treatise called Pernicious Anemia. And he talked about microspherocytes, marked the anemia as due to excessive destruction of blood and not to be deficient in formation, that they denote the anemia to be hemolytic, not hemogenic in its origin. And that's where the term came from. And we often forget that patients who are cobalamin deficient can, in fact, present with pic a picture that looks like routine hemolysis, except for the fact that the retic count in these patients is notoriously low. OK. So another question, does, does everyone recognize this? So this patient's hemolytic anemia, yes? Yes, no? OK. So this is classic. This is what? It's called out. This is, yeah. So this is classic sickle cell anemia. Um, what you'll notice, and I'm an old-fashioned guy, I still do peripheral smears in my clinic. Uh, I believe that you, know, you can make lots of diagnoses very inexpensively that way. If you don't want to make them yourselves, the lab makes them. But what we see here is a characteristic nucleated red blood cell. That's got to be a nucleated red blood cell because it's red uh, and has a nucleus. Nucleated red blood cells are never normal in the peripheral smear. They mean the marrow is under some kind of stress, either through hypoxia or blood loss or hemolysis. The other thing we see are the classic um, drepanocytes or sickled cell shaped red cells. Um, and um, we see red cells that have this targeting in the middle. And these are target cells, which we see with hemoglobinopathies and patients who have had their spleens removed. And uh, we also see this with liver disease. So uh, th th this is common in sickle cell anemia. You folks here uh, see sickle cell patients? They give a reasonably large population, actually. We have about 500 families or so in New Orleans. And you guys are probably close to that. Um, the sickle cell patients are seen by adult and peds. Is that right? Here, they're seen by both. And do you actually have a center, or are they mostly seen by the internist or the hematologist? Who sees them yet? Mostly the hematologist. OK. All right, good. All right. 
So I have a 27-year-old man with sickle cell anemia who requires hip replacement due to avascular necrosis. His baseline hemoglobin is 5 to 6. His current hemoglobin is 6.1. And the question is, how should he be managed uh, preoperatively? So this is more complicated um, uh, analog audience response. So A is no transfusion, B is simple transfusion to a hemoglobin of 10, C simple he transfusion to hemoglobin of 12, D is exchange transfusion to a hemoglobin of 10, E is exchange transfusion to a hemoglobin of 12, keeping the hemoglobin less, less than 30. Let's, let's all vote on this one. So who says A? Who says B? Who says C? Who says D? Who says E? Good, and we're all going to learn something today. All right, there are very, very few randomized trials in sickle cell. So a lot of what we do when we manage sickle cell patients is through um, something that we kind of say this makes sense, we get a gestalt. But there really is a randomized trial that pretty conclusively answers this. That the, the right answer is simple transfusion to 10. For the um, internal medicine residents in the room, raise your hand. This is an absolute board question, okay? So it's simple transfusion to 10. Um, what happened was in, um, uh, in uh, and I'm going to get to this, I think, a little bit later, but in 1994, a randomized trial appeared in the New England Journal where patients who had needed surgery that required anesthesia, so this isn't drainage of a finger abscess or something like that, but for inv invasive surgery requiring anesthesia, there was a randomized trial between simple transfusion and exchange transfusion, and the arms were the same, and simple transfusion is much easier to do. So really the answer here is simple transfusion to hemoglobin of 10, and we're going to get to that. Um, but we all know that sickle cell anemia is caused by a point mutation in the sixth position of the beta chain, substituting valine for glutamic acid. Trait is found in about 8% of African Americans, and for all intents and purposes is really clinically silent. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a, little, in a bit. It's diagnosed by electrophoresis. And homozygous patients with SS disease tend to have hemoglobins normally in the 6 to 8 gram per deciliter range. And we're going to talk about indications for transfusion as we go forward. The clinical features, what you all know about, what brings these patients to the uh, emergency room are vaso-occlusive crises, these painful crises. But patients can also get a plastic crisis, right? <laughs> so they can get a crisis where they don't retic. And somebody can call out, what's the primary cause of aplastic crisis? Parvo B19, exactly. And you can also see a form of aplastic crisis in these patients if they stop taking their folic acid, because their folic acid requirements are reasonably robust and reasonably large. Um, children and those who still have their spleen, because most patients with SS disease auto-infarct their spleen, um, early in life, maybe by age six or so, but children can get a sequestration crisis where red cells are sequestered in the spleen, and patients with SC disease can get a sequestration crisis. And more recently recognized, but and difficult to, to describe pathophysiologically, is this hyperhemolysis. And what happens here is a sickle cell patient comes in profoundly anemic profoundly hemolyzing, and when we give the, the, these patients blood, they continue to hemolyze at a very rapid rate. And exactly why that happens is not clear, and it remains relatively difficult to treat, quite frankly. Few clinical trials, if any in the literature, case reports, use of IVIG, use of erythropoietin, I, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but there are some studies looking at that, and difficult to treat, but certainly well recognized among people who take care of this population. So organ system involvement. So um, sickle cell disease, again, is a disease that transcends childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. But early on, you have problems with growth and development due to uh, bony infarction and other problems. We know about medullary necrosis of the kidney and priapism, another thing that frequently brings these patients to the emergency room. They can get cholestasis. And they can form pigmented gallstones due to the complexing of bilirubinate with calcium. 
They get high output heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. We're going to talk about that a little later. And in the eyes, they get retinal vessel occlusion and neovascularization. So really, although this is a point mutation in um, hemoglobin, we all now recognize that sickle cell anemia is a systemic disease. Okay. So um, other organ systems that are involved, uh, these patients get stroke and white matter disease. They get leg ulcers. They're prone to infection. And in pregnancy, the maternal mortality is elevated. Right? So although these patients are as fertile as non-sickle cell patients, there's a very high maternal fetal mortality actually with this disorder. I have a case. A 45-year-old man with hemoglobin SS presents with peripheral edema and shortness of breath. He has had multiple episodes of acute chest syndrome. On exam, he has crackles and a split S2 with a prominent pulmonic component. So what's his diagnosis? Pulmonary hypertension. So a relatively more recently recognized problem that carries a non-insignificant, in fact, a very significant morbidity and mortality. And we're going to talk about why sickle cell patients might develop um, pulmonary hypertension. So it's recognized again, New England Journal um, now some 12 years ago was the initial large description. Um, recognizes a major source of morbidity and mortality, occurs in over 30% of patients, and has a relative rate of death of, t of, of greater than 10. It seems to be resistant to hydroxyurea, and as of yet, we really don't have effective treatment for this disorder. There are people who have tried uh, endothelin um, antagonists like Bosantan and others, and they may work. And I have a slide, I think, to talk a little bit about um, sildenafil. But the reason that these patients get pulmonary hypertension is multifactorial and really predominantly related to nitric oxide and its effects. So these patients really have two problems. Who, the medical students are closer to this. So nitric oxide comes from what biochemical reaction? It's the arginase reaction, right? So arginine is converted to uh, citrulic acid at, with, with the release of nitric oxide, right? So one of the problems is, is that red cells contain arginase. And when red cells are destroyed, you break down the substrate for nitric oxide production. The other problem is the tail end of free hemoglobin sequesters and binds nitric oxide. So these patients are really nitric oxide deficient for a number of reasons. And we remember and we know that nitric oxide is important for vasodilation. Nitric oxide probably decreases platelet adhesiveness. Um, and it's very important. Um, so two problems with hemolysis and two reasons why these patients are nitric oxide deficient. And yes, there have been trials of nitric oxide in these patients. They've been equivocal at best. They've been small. There have also been trials of potential nitric oxide donor molecules to see if that improves some of the symptoms of, of uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, some of the other symptoms in this disorder, and it's unclear. Sildenafil, if you remember, is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that um, essentially um, prolongs the half-life of nitric oxide. And sildenafil has been studied in pulmonary hypertension and in sickle cell patients. But the WALT FAST trial in 2009 was halted prematurely because it looks like sildenafil increased painful crisis in patients with sickle cell anemia. So pulmonary hypertension is a cause of morbidity and mortality for the uh, internal medicine residents in the room, uh, and the interns in the room are going to recertify. You need to know that, and we don't really know how to treat the disorder. There are some patients with sickle cell that we still treat with sildenafil, even in light of, this, of the walk fast trial, but that's because we don't have a lot of other alternatives. But the walk fast trial suggested that these patients actually, or at least some of them, got in trouble when sildenafil was used. So how do we manage the disease? Well, as with any other hemolytic anemia, these patients have an increased requirement for folic acid. So we need to make sure that they're folate um, replete. 
They get vaccinated for encapsulated organisms because they become asplenic very early. Annual eye exams are important because of retinal proliferation. Hydroxyurea, I can't overestimate the importance of hydroxyurea, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but um, based on a randomized trial, again, one of only few randomized trials in sickle cell uh, that came out in the New England Journal in the early 90s where half the patients got hydroxyurea and half didn't, and that trial was stopped prematurely because of the overwhelming positive benefit of hydroxyurea in the treatment arm. Looks like hydroxyurea also prolongs life expectancy, and the problem is we don't use enough hydroxyurea, we don't use it in enough patients, and we don't dose it at the right dose. So in that trial, the dose was 35 milligrams per kilogram. Who, for the average adult, that would be about two grams. And I see many, many patients who are on 500 milligrams daily. That's a good place to start, but you gotta go up to really get the effect of hydroxyurea. And then, um, you know, bone marrow transplant is potentially curative, right? Because if you can change the bone marrow milieu to a normal hemoglobin, it's potentially curative. But we all know about the potential complications later on um, uh, with bone marrow transplant. That's why I put question marks. The um, adult trial, the biggest adult trial in bone marrow transplant for sickle cell took very sick patients and found an unfortunate high incidence of neurologic complications from the transplant regimen. But as now we do lower, now that we do sort of mini transplant or, or non mylos um, ablative transplant, maybe there's a, a further role for bone marrow transplant. Who knows? But that, you know, still is, there are still some centers that transplant um, some of these patients who uh, have uh, reasonably severe complications. Hydroxyurea, important molecule. Interestingly, um, there are many people who are trying to change the name of this molecule to um, hydroxycarbamide because many patients object to the, the phrase urea, so they won't take it because they think they're taking urine. Uh, really. So hydroxycarbamide is another name of this molecule and perhaps a preferred name. How does it work? Well, hydroxyurea inhibits RNA reductase and, and, and leads to cell death. Um, it also probably assists with the production of nitric oxide. Um, if you look, um, there's an NOH2 um, group here, so it probably is, uh, to some extent, a nitric oxide donor. But the other thing that it does is it activates soluble guanylate cyclase and increases hemoglobin F um, levels. And we've known for many years that we see sometimes patients with sickle cell anemia who seem relatively unaffected, and maybe they're 50, 60 years old, and many of those patients have hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, where they have high fetal hemoglobin levels. So we've known for a long time that fetal hemoglobin is protective in sickle cell patients, and hydro um, hydroxycarbamide actually does increase hemoglobin F levels. A randomized, this is a classic article from the early 90s, 1995, a randomized controlled trial showing marked improvement in outcomes among patients with greater than three crises per year. Uh, hydroxyurea may also help to prevent stroke. We're going to talk about stroke in a little bit. A recent article in Blood over the past couple weeks suggested uh, that at least in children, hydroxyurea after a period of transfusions uh, appeared to be beneficial in preventing further stroke. And again, I, I put May based on this JAMA article that's now 13 years old. Newer articles suggest that, that hydroxyurea, hydroxycarbamide, does improve survival in sickle cell patients. So a take home important message is if you have a sickle cell patient with crises, they ought to be on hydroxyurea. And they ought to be on a dose high enough uh, that they're getting an effect on their hemoglobin F. Uh, really important. One of the contraindications, obviously, is a woman in childbearing age who's not using a form of contraceptive, contraception or somebody who wants to get pregnant. But otherwise, this is a really important underused drug in this population of patients. One of the things that comes up clinically on the wards and on board exams and in training exams are who, do we, who and when and how do we transfuse these patients. Again, they run a pretty consistent anemia of five to six, and when do we transfuse, how do we transfuse, et cetera. So let's talk about some different types of transfusion. 
Your basic transfusion is a simple transfusion. That is, the patient's, like the patient we talked about in the morning report this morning, the patient's anemic and symptomatic and we give blood. That's a simple transfusion. Hypertransfusion is we give regularly scheduled transfusions, typically monthly. An exchange transfusion is when we bring in the phoresis machine, we remove uh, red cells containing hemoglobin S, we give red cells that don't con contain hemoglobin S, we target a final hemoglobin concentration, and we target a final percent hemoglobin S, typically less than 30%. So a much more expensive and a much more resource-intensive resource procedure, but there are indications. So simple transfusion um, is indicated when you need to increase the oxygen carrying capacity in the patient. So the patient uh, runs a hemoglobin of five, they come in, they're three, and they're symptomatic. Hypertransfusion we use for stroke prevention. And we've known, again, based on a randomized trial, not many of them in sickle cell, probably going to go through most of them in this talk, we know that if a sickle cell patient has a stroke, he or she has a 70% chance of having another stroke. And we know that we can decrease that by 50% if we give them blood on a monthly basis. Now the problem, we're going to get into that, is that they also get iron overloaded, right? And giving blood once a month is cumbersome. And, um, you know, uh, and hydroxyurea may have a role as well, but that's hypertransfusion. And then exchange, the indications are acute stroke, retinal artery occlusion, and um, maybe, um, uh, maybe in priapism. And most of these are not based on randomized controlled data. Most of this is expert opinion. Okay? We're going to talk about sickle cell chest, and many patients with sickle chest get exchange transfused, but there aren't good randomized trials. These are inappropriate indications for transfusion. For those of you taking boards and recertification, this is really important because this is what they try to trick you on. So chronic anemia, these patients are always anemic. That's not a reason for, for blood. Uncomplicated pain crises, not an indication for blood. Infections, minor surgery, not needing general anesthesia. Again, we talked in the beginning, if you need general anesthesia, you need a simple transfusion up to a hemoglobin of 10. Aseptic necrosis and uncomplicated pregnancies are inappropriate uh, reasons uh, for blood. And we have to be careful with blood in these patients because what I see are the overtransfused sickle cell patients who run into end organ problems with significant iron overload. And that's what we see. So I tell my sickle cell patients they can't get blood unless a hematologist, myself or one of their colleagues, says it's necessary. Because at my institution, the staff want to always transfuse these patients. And it just leads to all kinds of complications. And usually it's because there's a lure out there that if you give them blood, their pain crisis gets better and you can discharge them from the hospital. Or if you give them blood and they still have pain, they're malingering. And neither of those statements are true. So be careful with blood in these folks. Pain management, we don't use much Demerol anymore, but just we don't even give it, it's all formulary because it's metabolized to um, uh, normopardine, which significantly lowers the seizure threshold. Morphine's a preferred drug. Again, like other pain management, Dr. Marion's talked about this. We want to give long-acting meds for a period of time, and we also want them to have some medicine for breakthrough. Uh, PCA can be very important um, in this population of patients. Um, acute chest syndrome. So acute chest syndrome um, really is um, defined as the appearance of any of an infiltrate, chest, uh, chest uh, infiltrate, chest pain, or uh, hypoxia in a patient with a sickling disorder. And it's more common with SS disease, but it occurs also with sickle beta and it occurs with SC disease. It can be caused by infection, in situ thrombosis, fat embolism, or any combination. So the diagnosis of acute chest does not take into account etiology. So I've heard people say, this isn't acute chest, it's pneumonia. No, it's pneumonia causing acute chest. And the reason acute chest is important is because it's a major cause of death. And Ora Platt's uh, New England Journal article, which he looked at causes of death in sickle cell patients, acute chest was one of the major causes of uh, morbidity and mortality. 
We treat it with oxygen if they're hypoxic, antibiotics. And what's really important is patients with acute chest need blood. Now, do they need an exchange transfusion? Well, my practice is, is if they're in the ICU and sick and I can get an exchange, it's not in the middle of the night, I'll exchange them. But I can also give them some blood. We never want to have these folks with a hemoglobin higher than 10 because then they run into, into um, viscosity problems. But these people need blood. Why? Because part of the physiology of acute chest is circulating activated endothelial cells. And we need to dilute those because those cause um, stickiness of platelets and stickiness of red cells, and they lead to problems. Um, the incidence can be reduced um, by hydroxyurea, probably, and postoperatively incentive spirometry. So again, a randomized trial in sickle cell. Post-op patients, incentive spirometry or not, and not surprisingly, a um, significant improvement in pulmonary complications postoperatively with incentive spirometry. Hard to argue with incentive spirometry, but certainly in sickle cell patients, I make sure that patients get incentive spirometry. Preoperative considerations, again, oxygen, hydration. We talked about keeping the hemoglobin at 10 if they need general anesthesia. Uh, patients with SC disease may need exchange transfusion um, because sometimes we want to get their hemoglobin S down and the need of it for incentive spirometry. These are important. These are board questions, and it's just important management questions. So stroke. So we, I told you that about uh, patients with sickle cell have a markedly increased likelihood of developing a stroke and that you can decrease that risk of stroke, uh, you can decrease risk of subsequent stroke with transfusion. Uh, in kidneys, we can actually measure transcranial, um, using a Doppler, we can measure uh, transcranial um, arterial velocities. And just like a garden hose, if you squeeze it, the velocity is more coming out. And so we can predict kids that are at risk for stroke. Um, Several well-done randomized trials in kids, uh, the STOP trials, um, took kids with elevated transcranial Dopplers without stroke and exchanged them and found that you could actually prevent stroke in that population. Chronic transfusions, as we've talked about, um, reduce the risk of subsequent stroke by about 50%. And acute stroke, the recommendations are is that we uh, reduce the hemoglobin S to less than 30%. Usually that's with exchange. Um, and again, that recommendation is, is uh, not based on randomized data as much as um, expert opinion. And patients with S, S disease have the greatest risk of stroke, but I don't want you to forget that those with SC and S beta also are at risk for stroke. Outpatient management, because you know, we see a lot of these patients in the outpatient. Internists take care of these uh, patients in some hospitals. Contraception is really important. We talked about the maternal and fetal mortality, but these patients are just as fertile as non-sickle cell patients. Vaccination, folic acid, eye exam, pain assessment is critical. And then iron overload. And we're going to talk about that. But these patients get iron overloaded because we over-transfuse them. They also get iron overloaded because patients with hemolysis uh, absorb iron. Thalassemia, thalassemic patients really absorb iron. Sickle cell patients also tend to absorb iron more than non-sickle cell patients. The protein responsible for that is a hormone uh, recently described a couple years ago called erythroferone. I'm not going to get into that, um, but it, these patients do absorb iron, so we have to be vigilant for iron overload and treat it if it becomes apparent. And then I can't overestimate the importance of hydroxyurea uh, for these patients. So um, a year or two ago, um, uh, a group from the National Institutes of Health published some guidelines for the treatment of sickle cell anemia. And my Hemong fellows have copies of it. It's very important. These were summarized in JAMA in 2014. And what I want to give you is these are the strong recommendations that came out of that, um, uh, that, came out of that monograph that's well worth reading if you take care of sickle cell patients. Firstly, they recommend the prompt use of opioids for patients with vaso-occlusive crisis. 
Secondly, they recommend incentive spirometry for hospitalized patients and post-operative patients. They recommend the use of ACE inhibitors for microalbuminuria. They recommend ophthalmologic exams. They stress the importance of hydroxyurea and hydroxyurea given at an appropriate dose. They talked about that preoperative transfusion threshold, and they talk about the importance of iron chelation. So these were the strong recommendations from that uh, monograph. Again, due to the paucity of randomized controlled trials, a lot of that monograph is expert opinion. But, but when there is a, a well done or well done clinical trials, those become strong recommendations. So let's talk a little bit about sickle cell trait. Again, found in about 8% of African Americans, and it's a rare cause of morbidity. Um, patients with sickle cell trait can come into an emergency room with hematuria, especially if they get dehydrated. In fact, if you work in emergency rooms, it's one of the most common causes of hematuria in a young uh, black patient. There's question of increased thrombosis of the lung and maybe splenic infarction when you're hypoxic. It's interesting, the NCAA pushed screening, and the hematology community really reacted to that because there's no data that supports that patients with sickle cell trait should not participate in NCAA athletics. But there was a patient who died of sudden death who they found had sickle cell trait. So then they, the NCAA said, well, then everyone needs to be screened without looking as at is there a cause and effect. In fact, there probably was not in that patient. So are there new drugs for sickle cell? Well, there are. And remember, the pathophysiology is nitric oxide depletion, but it's also that red cells become sticky. And one um, area of research are selectin inhibitors. Selectins are, mo are sticky molecules that allow white cells to stick to a surface and roll. And there are selectin inhibitors that are being investigated in sickle cell disease. There are also non-anticoagulant heparins. So heparins that are uh, proteins in the heparin structure but don't anticoagulate. And they may also prevent red cell agglutination and red cell adherence to vasculature. There are MEK and ERK kinase inhibitors that prevent red cell trapping in fibrin strands. And I'm hopeful that as we go forward, we have d drugs in addition to um, hydroxyurea to prevent many of the complications that we see in this unfortunately common yet relatively un understudied and underfunded uh, diseases. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. The clinical case, a 62-year-old man presents to the emergency department complaining of five days of dyspnea on exertion and yellow skin. He has a history of hypertension treated with thiazide lisinopril and has otherwise been healthy. His exam is significant for a heart rate of 112 and ecteric skin and sclera. He has no peripheral adenopathy or, or organomegaly. So the question is, does this patient have hemolytic anemia? And we're going to come back to this case. Basic labs, hemoglobin is 6.8 with a crit of 20. Retic index is 6%. MCV is 137. Okay. Total bill is 14.2, direct bill 2.7, and his uh, transaminases are normal. So when you see an MCV of 137, what do you think about? I mean, that's even too big for B12. What do you think about? Well, one thing I'm going to tell you, it could be an elephant. And I've studied elephants, and their MCV is about 145. But this isn't an elephant. So what else could this be? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so red cell agglutination. So red cells sticking together. And I want to keep that in mind as we go forward. So here's a peripheral smear um, of this patient. And when you look you can see these agglutination of red cells. And what's happening is the culture counter is counting that sometimes as one red cell. So you can see how the MCV is as large as it is. And here's a high power view of the same thing. So the question is, why might red cells like this agglutinate? And we're going to come back to that. So when we talk about hemolytic anemia, um, there's different ways to divide things. There are congenital problems, which are membrane defects, ends up like um, hereditary spherocytosis or hereditary elliptocytosis. There are enzyme defects like G6PD deficiency that we're going to talk about at the end. There are hemoglobin defects like sickle cell that we talked about. And there are thalassemias that are abnormalities in alpha and or beta chain production. And then there are required uh, drug-induced infections such as um, uh, clostridial infections, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, PNH, and I'm going to focus uh, today's talk on autoimmune hemolytic anemia.
So when we talk about autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we're talking about an immune response to red cells that causes destruction. And there are three types. There's paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, which I'm going to dispense with quickly, because it's not something we see that often in, in adults and something that we less often even diagnose. And then we're going to talk about warm antibody hemolysis and cold agglutinin disease. So when we talk about this, there is some overlap. These are meant to be Venn diagrams where we have lymphoproliferative dis disorders like lymphoma that can be associated with warm or cold hemoglobinuria. We have some infections that tend to cause cold agglutinin disease, et cetera. And these temperature designations refer to what, at what temperature hemolysis occurs. So cold in this case just means colder than body temperature, colder than 37 degrees. Okay? Warm means it occurs at body temperature. So um, there are different mechanisms, and I'm going to go through these individually as we talk about the individual types. But when we talk about laboratory findings in autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we have varying degrees of anemia. The marrow typically responds normally with a reticulocytosis. We get increased um, unconjugated hyperbilirubin, increased LDH. Uh, a low haptoglobin. I've never checked a haptoglobin ever, and we're going to talk about why I don't check haptoglobins. Um, and a DAT, which is the Coombs test, uh, tends to be positive. Um, for the DAT, it's either positive for IgG, which is warm. We're going to get to that. It's positive for complement, which is cold, or both tend to occur with um, warm antibody hemolytic anemia. So let's talk about what is a Coombs test. Well, there's a direct Coombs test where what we do is we have IgG-coated red cells from a patient. We add an anti-IgG, and if we get agglutination, it means there was IgG on the red cell. Similarly, we can add an anti-complement. Okay? An indirect, we take the patient plasma containing IgG and antibodies. We add normal red cells. Now they're coated, and now we add that antiglot one. And interestingly, notice Coombs does not have an apostrophe S. That's because the guy who discovered this was named Coombs, not Coombs. Okay? So these are the Coombs tests, direct and indirect. There are some places we do a super Coombs test with uh, perceived increased sensitivity. I think we heard about one this morning um, in the uh, morning report. And these are done in some test um, centers, and they tend to use radioactivity so you can detect micro, uh, um, very small amounts of either complement or immunoglobulin on the red cell surface. And haptoglobin, as we talk about, binds the globin portion of free hemoglobin. Uh, it's then cleared from the circulation, so the levels decrease with hemolysis. The sensitivity is relatively low. The positive predictive value isn't great. And the problem that is, is when you send a tube of blood to the lab, it contains some free hemoglobin. So when you look, actually, at haptoglobin levels in patients who have been transfused, the haptoglobin levels go all over the place because of the stored blood. And when you look at blood in a sample tube, the haptoglobin can be all over the place. So I find it that it's, I just find it not to be a very helpful test. I look at blood smears to, to help me make diagnoses and Coons tests, etc. So look at the peripheral smear, and that's going to really tell you what you're looking at. So let's dispense with paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, rarer disease. What happens here is you have cold reacting IgG directed against a red cell antigen called the P antigen. It binds in the cold but causes hemolysis um, uh, at body temperature. It's associated with secondary syphilis. Interestingly, Paul Ehrlich described this. This was the first description of an autoimmune disease. He called it horror artoxicus. It's underdiagnosed and may actually be the most common uh, cause of autoimmune hemolytic anemia in children. But it's difficult to diagnose because it's this funny antibody. It tends to get better on its own. And what happens is, um, in this disease, is you get um, hemolysis through this membrane. So you get IgG that binds in the cold. And then at body temperature, you get this uh, membrane attack complex that destroys a red cell. So relatively undiagnosed tends to be self-limited. You can do a Donath Landsteiner test where what happens is um, when you uh, chill the tube and warm it up, this is control. And you see red cells and plasma that's a little orange but relatively normal. And in patients who have a positive Donath Landsteiner test, you get hemolysis just from chilling down the blood tube and then warming it up. Again, probably a common cause of hemolysis in kids, probably not as relevant in adults, and tends to be self-limited. 
Uh, there is a case report or two of successful treatment with rituximab, a monoclonal antibody to CD20. But, you know, not as common a disease, and just want to dispense with that to be thorough. Rituximab, again, we talked about this also in rounds today, is a chimeric uh, antibody to CD20 um, and originally developed for the treatment of B-cell lymphomas, but now is used in a variety of autoimmune diseases because it decreases um, uh, B-cell production and some of these B-cells make antibodies to things like red cells. Warm antibody hemolysis is probably the most common type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia that we diagnose. Um, it occurs when IgG binds to red cells. The IgG tends to be relatively spread apart on the red cells, so there's limited complement fixation typically. But what happens is the IgG-coated red cells are cleared by splenic macrophages. So the splenic macrophages actually eat these cells and destroy them. So the hemolysis is occurring in the spleen. The Coombs is typically positive for IgG, but may also be positive for complement because sometimes the IgG molecules may react to an antigen that's more closely spaced so that you can get complement fixation. And you get partial phagocytosis. So what do you see on the smear and warm antibody hemolytic anemia? Really important. You see spherocytes, right? You don't see schistocytes. That's microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And what's happening here is the warm antibodies you see in the upper left-hand corner or upper right-hand corner as you look at it, the warm antibodies uh, bind the red cell and the splenic macrophage then engulfs the red cell and destroys it by cartoon. Okay, typically these antibodies are directed against the RH antigen, which is a transmembrane uh, protein. In the interest of time, I'll skip that. And what you see on the peripheral smear that is very important is you see these guys and these guys and these guys, and those are microspherocytes. And the only times you're going to see spherocytes are warm antibody hemolytic anemia and what else? Franchise spherocytosis. So hematology is easy. It's always hereditary fill in the blank. It's also always right to say green leafy vegetables and Ashkenazi Jews. So heme boards are easy. You know those three things? You get your questions right. All right. These are spherocytes and they're round. And how do we treat this? Well, we can give glucocorticoids to block the antibody response. We can do splenectomy because that's where hemolysis occurs. And about two-thirds of patients, when they undergo splenectomy, get better. What happens is a third don't respond, a third get completely better, and a third get good enough better. Okay, so about a 70% response rate. There's cytotoxic therapy that's been described. And rituximab, again, has a reasonable response rate, but that response rate may be relatively short-lived. And intravenous immune, immune globulin what happens then is the splenic macrophage eats this immune globulin, not the immune globulin coating the red cell. So that can work as well. But probably the best long-term response is still splenectomy. Cold agglutinin disease, and this condition, again, occurring at colder than body temperature. Instead of IgG, you have IgM that binds to red cells. IgM fixes complement very well. So you get complement coating the red cells, and these cells are cleared in the liver. Your Coombs test in cold agglutinin disease is positive for C3. And what happens is this is this one of the antigens that's commonly recognized in cold agglutinin disease is the I antigen, which is a branched and, uh, um, antigen in adults. And what you see on peripheral smears is what I showed you. So what's happening is peripheral smears aren't done at body temperature. They're done at room temperature. So you get this agglutination. And this is what it looks like. And you can't get a good peripheral smear, really. And your MCV is going to be 137, right? So very classic cold agglutinin disease. This is what it looks like. How do we treat it? Well, we treat the, keep the patient warm. Unfortunately, splenectomy and glucocorticoids don't work for this mm -hmm. disease. Many of these patients, perhaps 70% or more, have an underlying lymphoproliferative disorder. So sometimes we can treat that disorder. We have to warm all infusions. So even if you give this patient IVs or blood, it's got to be given at body temperature. And that drives nursing staff crazy sometimes because they're not used to giving blood at 37 degrees. They want to give it at room temperature. And rituximab and fludarabine in one study in the British Journal of Hematology had a 75% response rate. This can be a very difficult disease to treat. I've seen this in New Orleans right when the temperature changes and somebody comes in bright yellow. And that's sort of the history that we hear. Uh, important for your boards uh, and recertifications, this does not respond to prednisone. 
That's really important. Where it's warm antibody, prednisone is, pre is first line therapy. And then echolizumab is a monoclonal antibody to the fifth component in complement. It was approved for use in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and also in atypical HUS that I'm not going to talk about. And there are case reports in cold agglutinin disease. Echolizumab is still a drug looking for diseases because PNH isn't a public scourge and it's very expensive. They want to see it used for a lot of things. But there are some case reports. This comes up all the time. So how do we transfuse these patients? Because even their own blood is not compatible, right? So there is no compatible blood. Their own blood's not compatible. That's why they're agglutin that's why they have agglutination, and that's why they have antibody clearance. And what happens is if patients are if blood's needed for symptomatic anemia, you gotta uh, transfuse the least incompatible blood. You have to. The blood bank's gonna say, well, I don't have a compatible unit. The patient's own blood's not compatible, but you don't want a patient to die of myocardial ischemia because you haven't given them blood. Really critically important. Important um, uh, for boards, but important for real life. And this is a rather complicated chart that I'm not going to go through. But essentially, what you do is you look for autoantibodies, and you match for all the antigens that you can, and you give the least incompatible unit. And that's really what you have to do. You have to match for ABL. You try to match for RH, and you try to uh, get the patient stable so they don't have a, a myocardial infarction while you're waiting for compatible blood, which doesn't exist. Again, warranted in symptomatic patients. Uh, patient's own blood is incompatible. This requires a lot of cooperation with blood banks and close clinical supervision. And we have patients in this country that die every year because of this. One family actually gave money to the American Society of Hematology to educate practitioners about this because her young son died waiting blood because they couldn't find a compatible unit, because there is no compatible unit. We avoid over-transfusions in all patients. And if patients are immunosuppressed or on fludarabine, you want to irradiate the blood to prevent uh, transfusion-associated uh, graft versus host. Um, and again, in patients with cold agglutinin disease, you need to use an inline uh, blood warmer. Some associated conditions, uh, I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. And back to the case, this was a case of cold agglutinin disease. That's why the uh, smear looked like it did. Um, this patient was Coombs positive for complement. The titer was 1 to 6,400. The thermal amplitude, that temperature at which hemolysis occurred, was close to body temperature. And uh, again, these patients have a relative, uh, an odds ratio of having an underlying lymphoproliferative disorder of about 25, and the patient in question actually responded to rituximab. So quick case as we finish up, a 62-year-old man with a five-year history of benign prostatic hypertrophy began treatment for a UTI four days prior with levofloxacin. Because of extreme dysuria, he was also treated with phenazopyridine. He presents with extreme fatigue and, and icteric sclera. His hemoglobin is 8.3. Here's his peripheral smear. What do you see? What do you see? What is that cell there? And it's called a blister cell, or a bite cell, pretty much uh, consistent with the diagnosis of what? G6PD deficiency. And that's what I wanted to describe. This is an X-linked recessive disorder, so we seldom see it in women. They have to have two bad genes or incomplete lionization. Um, G6PDA uh, is found in about 10% of African Americans, and G6PD Mediterranean is the other type. And deficient persons are at risk for oxidative hemolysis. There's a bunch of drugs to avoid, but these are some of the drugs that we commonly see now. Uh, most notably, on uh, this patient, uh, peridium or phenazopyridine. And importantly, we don't check uh, levels after an acute hemolytic event, because what happens is we, we uh, destroy the um, uh, older cells that are mostly deficient, and you're left with those more resistant younger cells. So you can miss the diagnosis. Um, and the treatment is simple. We uh, avoid oxidative drugs and treat symptomatically. So here are some take-home points from today's talk. Remember, remember, remember how important hydroxyurea is for patients with sickle cell disease. We want to transfuse SS patients conservatively. We want to recognize pulmonary hypertension. We talked about the three types of hemolytic anemia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, 
talked about the importance of reviewing a peripheral smear. We talked about the importance of transfusing the least incompatible blood unit in patients who require blood with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And the G6PD deficiency typically occurs in male patients. When I'm asked to see a woman with suspected G6PD, it's just unusual. And uh, with that, I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. I think we have a minute for questions. Is that right? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. yeah. We, had a, we had a young lady that was admitted with a sickle cell pain crisis. We managed her in the hospital and then discharged her. And she said she was fine for those two days. And then she went for her scheduled um, transfusion. And she was transfused for what reason? For uh, the stroke prevention. Okay. Young lady. And so she went for that after discharge. And then she said she went into a, a pain crisis after getting that transfusion and was readmitted. And so I was wondering, is there a time frame between the resolving crisis and doing the scheduled transfusion, or is there any relationship? There's not. That's an unusual scenario. Typically, you know, if for hemoglobin, that's an unusual scenario. Was she given pain meds on uh, long acting pain meds? Uh, on discharge? She was given long acting pain meds. Her hemoglobin was around 6.5 in the hospital, and then after the transfusion, she went up to about 8. Uh -huh. That's interesting, uncommon, probably true, true and unrelated, but interesting. Other questions? Um, I wonder if that patient was getting a partial exchange? Not in the, in the hospital. Because uh, many of our patients, if you can get them to show up, get partial exchange. Kind of to, so I, I wanted your comments on partial exchange transfusions. I just think it's expensive and we don't have data. So if I'm going to exchange a patient, I'm going to exchange a patient. If I'm going to spend the money, I'm going to do what's been studied. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Criticisms? I thank you for your time. Thank you.